Both. Right. Goodness, there's a lot of props here. Uh, so I've got two disclaimers. Uh, the first is there's quite a lot of people in the front two rows that I know, so it's really <laughs> off-putting. And the second is, um, well, I can only describe it this way. Um, about five years ago, I was in China, and it was like this international conference. And uh, I was really like wound up and nervous. So I did this speech and you know, I had this really cool PowerPoint and it was great. I felt really pumped at the end of it, loads of clapping, blah, blah. Anyway, at the end, this little group of Chinese students came up to me and they said, we loved your presentation. It was fantastic. You speak so slowly. We understood every word of English you said. I'm a slow talker. <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah, so I, I started up uh, something called Freedom Bakery, uh, which is a social enterprise based in Glasgow, and uh, we run an artisan bakery that wholesales, and we work with prisoners and uh, people coming out of prison to train them up, more generally to get any kind of job, um, but where we can, we take them into our uh, workforce as well. So uh, the idea was an entirely selfish one because I was doing this PhD in uh, down south and, um, and, it, and it was dreadfully boring and I just couldn't, couldn't face another three years of it. In fact, I didn't turn up to the first day. So, um, <laughs> so I decided, well, if I'm gonna drop a career, I might as well do something I like, which is uh, food. Um, I'd never baked a loaf of bread before, but I thought it would be quite easy. Um, but I, I was really wrong. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, eventually, like, I cornered a few guys. Um, so an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman, uh, they enter a, um, uh, an environmentally friendly coffee bar somewhere in Glasgow, and we hash out a plan that, well, maybe there's something in this idea that um, we could set up a bakery, uh, yeah. Ooh. jumping ahead, uh, inside a prison, and that that bakery uh, may train people up, and that it would trade, uh, and that's a really key aspect of this, um, which I'll get onto a bit later. Um, why bread? Uh, I mentioned that I thought it would be easy. That was wrong. What I meant by that is I thought it would be simple. And the thing about baking is it's something we've been doing for thousands and thousands of years. And uh, it's in its simplest form, flour, water, and salt, and that's it. And working with a group of people in prison where you can't assume anything, um, you might assume that they've eaten a slice of bread in their life. Uh, the prison population in Scotland, and it's pretty much c concurrent with the rest of the UK, 80% um, of people in prison have diminished numeracy and literacy levels. 80% um, have suffered from or are suffering from uh, a mental health condition within a year. And 80% uh, have suffered from or are suffering from um, an addictions problem. So it's chronic and I always say the prisoner is just a name, the person is perhaps the sort of worst case example of a social problem that we can't fix and they end up in prison. So anyway, uh, in 2015, we uh, partnered up with a prison, which I affectionately like to call the Death Star, because of the way it looks from, from the sky. Uh, this is HMP Lomos, which is just on the outskirts of Glasgow. Um, it is a uh, maximum security prison. There are 750 uh, inmates there. 50% um, are short-term prisoners, which is defined as uh, having a sentence of four years or less, and 50% are long-term prisoners. Um, 
So we set up a contract with the government um, which had no precedence because, uh, because we were a social enterprise and they were only used to charities and they were only used to charities that received grant funding from, from government or big trust funds. Um, and we wanted to trade. And what happened was that the contract would allow us to set up a kitchen inside the prison um, to uh, run shifts in there and were to uh, take on pris a prisoner team, basically, train them up on the job and uh, get them through baking qualifications, which incidentally was the same qualification as the bakers we employed. It was quite a high uh, level qualification. Uh, it was always very important to me uh, to have a very different approach in this. And um, what people say, I don't know which people, but you know, it keeps getting punted around that if you sell charity, um, you sell it once because people aren't, well, they'll give you some money, here, yeah, go away, do your thing. Um, or charities love to get you on a subscription because then you can't really get away from it. Um, but if we're a company that trades, uh, if we have a product or a service, that product or service needs to meet the market needs, i.e. like just what people want and what people desire, and to be therefore competitive with the world. So um, we, we, we basically uh, set about creating a product range of, uh, in my humble opinion, the best bread in the west of Scotland. Um, so uh, predominantly that means we're like making sourdoughs and some speciality uh, Scottish uh, recipes that have died and then got revived um, in a sort of artisan uh, light. Um, and uh, basically we wanted to like come up with the best product we could, not scrimp on any costs, keep it honest and uh, true and see whether we can make it work in business. Um, and it go, you know, this goes as far as provenance. So th this is the farm where our wheat is grown. It's, um, it's like 13 or 14 miles south of here. And the farm is called, it's called Mungo's Wells. Uh, and the guy, uh, Angus, the farmer, he, he was a, a mechanical engineer by trade. He, lo he looks like um, Doc out of Back to the Future. <laughs> and he kind of talks like him, but with like quite a posh Scottish accent. And uh, he built his own flour mill. Um, so he, mill he grows the wheat, he mills the flour, and then we buy it from him, you know, in huge quantities. Um, but there was always something very important about what we were making and where it was coming from um, because uh, yeah, we just wanted to do the best thing by the product, not, not just with the people. Um, I haven't forgotten about, a about the prisoners and the people, I'll get to that later. Um, but here's a little bit more of food porn for you because it's, it's a really great croissant. We buy this French butter, it's just fantastic. Uh, you can't buy it here, but you'll have to come to Glasgow. Anyway, sorry, moving on. So yeah, yeah, let's get to the problem. Um, so there's this statistic, uh, you know, <coughs> rolling about, uh, mainly by me actually, but someone else came up with it. Um, which says if you get someone that's been in prison into a job and they hold that job for five years, the taxpayer saving in Scotland is £940,000. It's a load of tosh. It's complete rubbish. I'm, I'm sure I don't believe this at all. But the, pro the point there is it, we don't know what it costs because it's such a big problem and there's so many organisations and uh, you know, politics involved that it's a, it's a black hole, basically. And the reason being is um, it's too hard to tackle. And what we've tried in the past doesn't work. And we only have one approach, which is basically coming from policy. Um, so how did we get set up? Because despite everyone knowing how costly it is for someone 
to go into prison, to come out, to not be able to get a job, to go back in, and what we call a reoffending cycle. Um, you'd be interested to know that there is no funding available for such things um, like us. Uh, there are for sort of programs that teach you how to work. Um, I don't know if any, you, you all have jobs, presumably. If you haven't, you've had a job, but I, I don't think you ever went on a course that said, this is how you do a job. But there isn't a job at the end of it, but you should do this because then we can say that you're employable now. And that's kind of the logic behind a lot of these things. So, I mean, you know, even though we have like big politicians endorsing us and, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I think... Um, I think Mr. Matheson's an okay guy, but he, you know, he's a rubbish baker. <laughs> <laughs> there's a complete disconnect between that and us. And, and, and there's something very interesting about the social enterprise world, which is um, it's booming. 7,000 social enterprises in Scotland. 3,000 started in the last two years. Great, great. But some, where the money comes from, the, the, the funding or the opportunities available to you in that, in that startup journey, they're, they're mirrored. And some, some, some things cost a lot to start. It was a very expensive thing to set this up in, in a prison. So uh, we couldn't, we couldn't. And uh, we've got... Uh, 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 Mr. B over here um, it was, became quite interested and um, sent henchmen down like, yeah, we'd be quite interested to put some money into this. This sounds great. But there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's another side of this which um, sat uncomfortably with me where uh, you would just be buying some PR, basically, uh, which wouldn't work because as soon as that becomes you're buying PR then it doesn't matter what the business is that it does or how it helps and works with people it's about a story so in the end actually uh, there was no opportunities except to create our own startup uh, investment and uh, I, I, I'm a bit of a geek I might have hinted at that when I was talking about PhDs and conferences and that and uh, found this new tax scheme, which allowed me to basically take private investment. Um, and those, those people that put the money in, they get a tax rebate. But it's in a loan, they have no control over me, thank God, because <laughs> I'm renegade. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, afterwards, uh, uh, I, I wrote a, this is how you do it, guide to social investment, it was great. This is, this is great. This is like Jane Austen, but without, without the coquettish jokes. I mean, it's, it's dry as hell. But if you want to raise some money, it can be quite useful. And uh, in fact, you know, we, we, we punted this around. And I've, we've done consultancy. And we've helped some organizations raise over a million pounds since, since doing this weird uh, little investment thing that's not really an investment thing, but, you know, there you go. Um, Okay, so uh, I, I, I've kind of skirted around the actual uh, point of all this, which is people, actually. And uh, this guy won't mind you, me telling you his story. His name is Joe, and we've known him basically since the start. So July 2015, his psychiatrist uh, asked whether we might have space for Joe, and uh, dare I say it, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd never even employed someone before, so I got no experience of people at that point. And we took him on, and he was extremely quiet. Um, but anyway, he took to this like a duck to water. And the point is that, um, I, uh, controversially, what I'm going to say is we didn't do anything for him, <laughs> and probably haven't done anything for anyone. It's very much down to whether someone wants to uh, learn something and believe that they can change uh, their trajectory. Because this guy is 41 years old and he's been in and out of prison since the age of 15. So in and out of prison that 
when he got released in um, June 2016, we, we, we didn't have a bakery outside, so, and uh, people with criminal records, funnily enough, are not allowed to work inside prisons. Um, <laughs> so we couldn't give him a job. And uh, he, he, he was signing on, and uh, because he had a criminal record, he didn't go through you know, the front doors of the job center. I don't know if any of you have been there. I've, I've still got my, uh, my, my work plan from when I was signing on, and there's, these, there's lots of um, security guards. Anyway, they take Joe round the back and they say, okay, mate, look, yeah, go through this door, secure. You know, you're basically walking into a glass box, and you'll, you'll meet your advisor there. Um, advisor for what, you know, in the end, because his advisor turned around and said to him, you haven't got a hope in hell. Just come in every two weeks, we'll sign you off. If you want, we'll put you up for a sick uh, incapacity benefit as well, because you're not gonna get a job. There is no jobs for people like you. And I think that that in itself um, sort of perhaps uh, explains the, the sort of uh, miserable state of affairs when it comes to trying to help people uh, find work who have a criminal record. Um, we don't. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Joe, once, once, once things went further on, oh, their pardon. Once things went further on, we gave him a job. Um, he absconded a couple of times, but we have this uh, three and out. It's four, it's four staff as well, and he's not the only one that's had uh, uh, disciplinaries. Um, and he's doing really well, and I can't get rid of him now because he's too good. So he's, uh, he's full time. He's full time. He's with us for good. Um, Things with the prison didn't really work out. Um, we, in order to get in, I <laughs> negotiated really badly with the government and uh, we were paying 2,000 pounds a month for a kitchen um, that had a very small capacity. You could only fit four people inside it. But we did it to get in, to try and do something, to start something. and. Uh, dare I say, uh, business slightly prevailed in this because we had a product going out and there was a really big demand for it. And people really liked it. They, you know, sometimes they go, look, you know, we really, we, this is a great story. We don't give a shit about that. We like, we want the bread, you know, just give us the damn bread. Earlier this year, we raised uh, a quarter of a million pounds in investment, which allowed us to break out of prison, <laughs> and, and seriously, it did feel like we were breaking out of prison. It was, it was great. <laughs> and we opened a, a new state-of-the-art bakery in Glasgow, uh, which uh, started in May um, this year, and uh, we started trading from there at the uh, last week of May. And uh, based on the figures of last week's uh, sales, we've, we've quadrupled our income in five months. And, uh, and we will continue to grow, hopefully, um, again over the next year. And then this is completely, completely financially sustainable and we'll be in a room to sort of plan what we do next. Do we, do we come over to Edinburgh and open a bakery here? Do we open a shop in Glasgow? I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what happens. We've got 50 wholesale customers, um, 10 employees. Three of them are people that we've trained inside prison. Um, we've worked with 27 people since starting. Um, quite a lot of them it didn't work out. This wasn't right for them. But uh, of the people released and, and out and about, that's not that many actually, it's only um, seven. But five of them have jobs. Um, so we're doing something right. The problem is it's too, it's too small to say, do you know what, our prison system's Victorian. 
we really need to like wake up and do something like what there is, you know, what's happening in Scandinavia or other places in the world where they're miles ahead of us. And the reason it can't change is because no one wants to talk about prisons. And when a politician comes in as the cabinet secretary, they're, they're told, or, you know, just keep your head down, no bad press stories and you'll be out in two years. And unfortunately, that's the way things stop and don't progress. Anyway, I'm not sure if I've been fast or if I've been slow, but that's the end. Thank you.